Hello, welcome to Chickenlandia and welcome to Bok Talk, your 100% friendly backyard chickens show. I am the president of Chickenlandia. I am a backyard chicken educator here in the Pacific Northwest, and I want to welcome you so much to Chickenlandia. Thank you for being here today. Today, we are going to talk about controlling flies in the chicken coop. Now, um, (laughs) this is like the bane of all chicken keepers. Nobody really likes flies very much. You know, it's kind of sad, kind of sad for the flies. Nobody really likes them that much. Um, I know some of you guys are already dealing with flies because you're like, you're into the summer here. We don't, you know, our weather is still a little bit cool, but um. You know, in chicken keeping, we have four seasons. We have spring, we have uh, molting, we have fly, okay, we have spring, we have fly season, we have molting season, and then we have winter. And somewhere in there is parasite season. That's usually like in, during molting season. <laughs> so those are, those are the uh, chicken seasons. And right now we're in fly season. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, And I'm going to be answering a listener question today. And if you want to submit a question to Bok Talk, then all you have to do is go to my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com, go to the contact section and click ask a chicken question. And you can also like tell me a chicken story, like there's an option for that too. (laughs) But definitely while you're there, you should... Uh, join Chickenlandia Nation. That's my mailing list. And I'm like, I am so like not spammy. Like I do not send out tons and tons of emails, but you should join Chickenlandia Nation because there are some perks. And one of them is, is that you will get a coupon for my online course. It's a fun interactive course and it's called Chickenlandia's Backyard Chickens 101, a chicken course for everyone. So be sure and sign up to be in Chickenlandia Nation, and you'll be in the most awesome chicken club in the universe. <laughs> so let me say hi to some of the people that are here. Let's see who's here. Ah, it's going so fast. Susie Floozy's here. Hello, Leslie is here. Ann Day Morris is here. Village Stetter. And the Chickenlandia Presidential Advisor is here. That is my trusty moderator for today and she is also a um, co-instructor in the course because she's super duper knowledgeable. Judy Zims, Just a Mere Farmsteader is here. Mariah Grosh is here. Yasin Assad, I hope I am saying your name right. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Shauna is here. Ta- uh, Tamara is here. I hope I'm pronouncing. Why am I having a trouble pronouncing that? <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. The nature kid is here too. Okay. All right. So before we get into the fly business, we're gonna get we're gonna get deep into the fly business. I need to make two announcements because, as you guys know, I say this every time. I gotta pay those chicken bills, and there goes my dogs. <laughs> barking like crazy. I think somebody's at the door. Yeah, my my chickens are bougie. Like they they have high demands. They place high demands on me, so I have to pay those chicken bills. Anyway, um as always, I want to let you guys know that this podcast was brought to you by the folks at My Favorite Chicken. My Favorite Chicken is my favorite online shop to get my feed. They have scratch and peck feeds. You guys know that that is my favorite. It's non-GMO. It's organic. Um, they've got chicken supplies. They've got fun chickeny stuff. <laughs> and they have fun chicken treats. Like they have one called Chicken Fun Do. And uh, my, my, it's super fun. My chickens love that. Um, that is myfavoritechicken.com. And I will leave a link in the show notes and in the description. This podcast was also brought to you by Small Pet Select. Small Pet Select is local to me, but they have an online uh, shop that if you're in the United States, you can get to them. Um, They have two products that I am very much into right now. They've got some organic pine shavings, which are are great quality, great for deep litter. And they have my absolute favorite thing, pet greens. And this is like a little pouch 
that grows fodder inside this little pouch, little sprouts inside the pouch. It's super easy. It's super fun. Kids love to do it. And you just cut the greens off the top and feed them to the chickens. So if you're like in the city or in the suburbs, like where I used to be, my chickens didn't get fresh greens. And so I had to be like really mindful about providing that for them. So one of the ways you can do that, especially if you have a small flock, is to use these pet greens. And they also have like, if you have other fur babies like chinchillas or um, <laughs> they have like rabbit stuff, it's it's a it's a cute website. Definitely go there, check it out. And if you go into the show notes or in the um, description, you will see that there is a little coupon. So that is small pet select. Okay, I did not bring my water in here. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna like by the end of this, I'm gonna be like. <laughs> I'm going to sound, I'm going to sound like an old lady or something. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'll be okay. So in Chickenlandia, we love all creatures of the earth. We really do. And we respect that every creature has a place and a purpose. Even flies, even flies have a purpose. They are very, a very important part of our ecosystem. You know, if tomorrow all of a sudden we had no flies on the planet, literally there would be no humans. Like there would be nothing. Like life would just get, it would not be good. It would, it would like, it would not be a good situation. Um, so yeah, like flies, they clean up the world. That's what they do. And um they're so important. You know, I just want to tip my hat to them before we get started. I tip my hat to all the good work that the flies do, but I also acknowledge that they are so utterly annoying <laughs> and, and they can be really gross and nobody wants to deal with them. So we're going to talk today about how to just kind of like get that balance back into our coops so we're not dealing with like you know, the situation where we walk into our coop and we're just surrounded by flies or worse, there's so many flies in our coop that they're like, now they're in our yard. Now they're in our house. Now they're in the neighbor's house. Like we don't want that. So let's talk about how we can kind of bring some of that balance back into, into our lives and into our chickens' lives. Okay, let me turn the page. Because I don't memorize all this. <laughs> okay, so first I want to talk about some simple things that uh, we can do to control flies that, you know, that these things are not going to hurt the environment. Um, they instead work with the environment because, you know, like I said, we do not want to cause an imbalance in, in our ecosystem um, because that will bring with it a, a host of other issues and it just affects, really it can affect the whole world, how we are in our own little local ecosystem. So let's start out with our listener question. It is from Jason and Jason says, I'm a new chicken owner here and we love our girls. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Chickens need love. Uh, we have a temporary coop while we wait on our Carolina coop to get shipped. So if you guys don't know what a Carolina coop is, I was on their podcast. They have a podcast called Radio Chicken, I think. And, and when they air it, when they do, they do it live also on YouTube and it's called Video Chicken. Anyway, they're, they're great, great people. And they build like these amazing chicken coops, it's like my dream coops. But they also have these... Um, smaller ones that you can buy like that you can put together. Um, anyway, so he's waiting for him his to get to get shipped. And he says, I live in East Texas and it's starting to get very hot. <laughs> so he said this about a month ago, I think. <laughs> it's starting to get very hot. It's really hot there right now. In fact, my mom is visiting right now and she's from Texas. Um, so it's hot. Uh, I noticed that our coop is loaded with flies. We don't want our girls living with these pests. Please help. Thanks. Okay, Jason. So um, like I said, my mom's visiting from Texas. And also I grew up in Texas and my sister still lives there and she has chickens. And it's just like, I mean, it is hot. Like <laughs> it's so hot when it, 
when it gets hot, it gets really, really hot and humid and people just don't, if you don't live there, you just don't know how hot it can get. Um, so I can only imagine what you're going through with is pesky flies. So first off, and Jason, this might not be so helpful to you at the beginning, but it will help you for next year. And then I'll tell you some more things that will help you. Um, but I want to start off with just saying that you will be so much better off if you get started on a, some kind of fly con control, some kind of fly program, um, and, and this helps with other summer pests too, but it, you'll be so much better off if you start out before the summer starts. So before fly season starts, that's when you want to start thinking about, okay, what am I going to do to you know, work on having a balanced system in my coop that does not include a whole ton of flies flying around me every time I go in there. Um, and I say this knowing that I should have done this podcast like two months ago or three months ago, but you know, I, d I don't think about it really until, you know, maybe like last month I started thinking about it because our weather is so different up here and I just need to remember, okay, you know, in other places it's like really hot already. So I need to like get, I need to get with the program on that, but I, I missed the boat this year. Anyway, we can use this, the, use this information for next year too, if you need to. Um, you know, right now it's like 50 degrees outside here. Um, so I, let's talk about these preemptive things. Um, and these are things that you do before the invasion happens. Okay. So number one, Keep your coop relatively clean all year. And I know that you're probably thinking like, you know, this is common sense, okay? And I know, but I'm still going to say it because sometimes we just need to hear this kind of thing. We need those gentle reminders and we need to be reminded that, you know, flies like being around poop. That is like their dream life, okay? That's success to a fly. It's their favorite thing. Um, you know, they see poop and they think like, oh my gosh, this... This smells really good. This tastes really good. Um, this is super nutritious for me. And I just want to, I just want to raise my family right here in the middle of this. So, <laughs> so that's what we don't like. We don't want them to raise their families in our coops, but that is how serious flies are about, about poop. Um, so just do the best that you can, just keeping the area relatively clean. I am not somebody that's going to tell you to keep your coop sterile, you know, or to clean it every day or anything like that. You know, you might be one of those people that's like, I do like to pick up the poop every single day. I'm not. I'll start out by saying that. Um, but you can keep it relatively clean. And if you're doing deep litter, what you need to do is make sure that it's staying turned really well. You don't want like wet poop to be really collected like in a corner or something, because that's where they will go to lay their eggs. And then you'll end up with maggots in there. So um, just make sure you're turning it very well if the chickens aren't turning it well enough for you. Um, and, you know, if you if you find that doing the deep litter method during the summer months or during those during those warmer months where there's flies around, if it's just not working, then you might consider just don't do the deep litter method during, during those months. And that's okay. You know, it's okay because, you know, in chicken keeping, there's just not a one size fits all. And it really depends on where you live, what your climate is like, what your coop is like, what your specific situation is like. And, you know, there are, there are situations where you could have a coop where one thing works and you, you have what, works really well in your flock and it could be like you know just 20 minutes away and that same thing is not working for that person you know that lives 20 minutes away and I know that for sure because I was doing the deep litter method at my old place which was in like a suburban area and it were it was so easy and was working out really well once I got the hang of it it was working really well and then when I moved here, it was like this area has like this little microclimate and everything's different. Like the dirt is different. Everything's different. And I was like, wait, I'm like 20 minutes away from my old place. But I had to like relearn 
how to make the deep litter method work here. And right now I don't, I'm not doing it. Um, I, I had ended up with some lice in, in my, in my flock. So I had to clean out the coop. Um, so, you know, if you're just finding that I am not able to control these flies during the winter, then go ahead and clean out the deep litter. And then next year you can stop deep litter before fly season starts and just get ahead of it. Okay. Um, so the next thing that has really, this is what I do. Um, this is the main thing that I do that really works for me. Um, it is something called fly predators. And what fly predators are is they're like little, they're itty bitty tiny wasps that feed on the, um, on fly babies. <laughs> If, if pupa if you want to get like super <laughs> scientific they they feed on on fly lar uh, pupa and so um they will control the flies before they even get a chance to you know to reach adulthood and you can order them online i, I will put a link in the show notes and in the description for you um they arrive and it basically they're like unhatched or like they're just starting to hatch and you can place them, you can sprinkle them around or you can place them in some type of container. Maybe like they come in like these, they usually will send with them some like mesh pouches that you can put them in and you can hang those in your coop. Um, but the main thing is, is you have to put them where your chickens can't get to them. So if you can like fashion a container where they can, obviously they can breathe through it, but the chickens can't get to it. And you might want to put some poop in there like some wet <laughs> matter in there because they like that um so uh but just make sure that the chickens can't get to them because they'll eat them and it's like that's an expensive treat for a chicken <laughs> you don't want that um and yeah they're they're great like I use them I start out with them I use them about once a month and I start out with them right before fly season because you really, with something like fly, fly predators, you've got to start before the season starts and to, to, to make it to where they can't just start that life cycle that's pretty fast for a fly. And, you know, once they start it, it's like it's hard to kind of catch up to them. Um, the one issue that many people have with fly predators is that um, it's an extra expense and it's not like super cheap. Um, some people either can't spend the money on that or they just don't want to. So I completely understand that. That's, you know, that's, it's one basic drawback. Um, the other thing is they don't completely eliminate flies. So, and to, for me, like, I don't mind that because remember I'm re I, I'm trying to find balance in the chicken coop and, and in the chicken yard and in my, in my whole environment really. So I'm not like, super upset about there being a few flies. I just don't want there to be like that infestation going on in my coop because that's not healthy. That's out of balance. So, um, you know, it's not totally about eliminating them. It's about letting them have their important role in the ecosystem while also not letting them, you know, you know not getting overrun by them. So just keep that in mind. Um, so another thing that I really love using in my coop for many reasons are essential oils. Now, I know that essential oils can be controversial, um, but I use them. I I I like them. I I like using certain ones, gentle ones with my chickens. I don't think that they cure all things. I'm not telling you to, you know, feed it to your chickens or anything like that. I really just don't put it I don't put them directly on my chickens unless they're like in some type of formula that I know is safe for them. And I don't um, put feed them uh, to my chickens internally. Um, but um, they're in my chicken toolkit, toolkit and they have a lot of great, uh, great uses in certain circumstances. Um, and so, and one of them is pest control. So what I will do is I will get some oils that I know are good at rep repelling flies and other kinds of kinds of pests. Uh, lavender is really good. Mint, rosemary, but lemon is really good. And there's others that are, are good too. Um, 
And what I have up in my coop is I have little car di- diffusers, which you can like buy anywhere. You can order them online. They're not like the kind of diffusers that you have to plug in and, um, you know, they they like you have to put water in them. It's not like that. They're just they don't need heat or anything like that. It's just basically like this. These little mine are like little rainbows and they have beads on them. And I put the essential oils on the beads. And then that, you know, that fragrance goes through the coop, through the coop. It makes a coop smell great. And, it, you know, in the winter, I also use these diffusers. I use some of these oils and some other clearing oils to help keep, you know, their respiratory systems working well. Um, so, but you don't have to buy anything. You can actually just go and get, or you don't have to buy a diffuser. You can just get some paper towels or even like old rags or whatever, like little small rags and tie those up in the coop and just put a few drops of these essential oils on them. And, and that will work great. And just remember to like, you know, put the drops every few days just so it keeps it smelling fresh. Um, and I would use this along with some other type of pest control thing. So like I use these with my fly predators and that works very well for me. Um, if you aren't into essential oils or if you just want to grow something yourself, you can grow the actual plants of, of these things. So like you can grow rosemary, you can grow mint, you can grow lavender, you can grow lemon balm. And these, like, I love growing herbs like this. And I'm not much of a, like, I'm not a gardener. I am not a gardener. There's so many chicken people that are like, and chicken educators that are like, not only am I, not only do I have this beautiful flock of chickens, but I'm also a a master gardener. (laughs) I'm just like, I am jealous. (laughs) Because my houseplants are dead, okay? I'm not a great gardener. I wish I was. Every year I try. But I can grow herbs. You know, herbs are so easy to grow. And you can just grow them like around the chicken coop. Not in it because obviously the chickens will eat them and not even let them grow. Dig them up and all that stuff. But you can grow them in containers or whatever. Um, So you grow them, dry them, and then sprinkle them around the coop. You know, and that's going to help. That does just another layer of protection. Um, and then also, if you if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to grow anything, there are prepackaged dried herbs that you can buy. Um, there's several companies that make them. I, you know, one of the one that I'm using right now is from my favorite chicken. Uh, it's just their nesting box herbs, and they smell great and they help to repel flies. So I will put those in the nesting boxes, and I'll put, I'll I'll sprinkle that around the coop. And it just smells so good and helps keep those flies away. So if you have done all these things, or if it's already late in the season, you're already dealing with flies, then you're probably going to want to kind of up that fly game and, and go with, you know, some product that will help to eliminate the flies that you have now. So um, you know, the, a really simple one is just food grade diatomaceous earth. Um, now, and you can just take it and sprinkle it around the coop. You can sprinkle it in the nesting boxes. You can put them, you know, while you're at it, put a little bit in their, um, dust, dust bathing area. Like if you have a dustbin that you created for them, you can put them in there, put it in there. Now I, I will just mention, and I always mention this when we talk about diatomaceous earth, um, it gets a really bad rap. And the reason for that is that there's more than one kind of diatomaceous earth. There is crystalline diatomaceous earth and amorphous diatomaceous earth. And what you want is amorphous diatomaceous earth. And that is what food grade diatomaceous earth is. Okay. Now it has to have, I can't remember what the percentage, I think it's like, it's got to be less than 1% contain 1% crystalline. So it may have a little bit of the crystalline in there, but it's it's very negligible. And even with crystalline diatomaceous earth, you do need extended exposure, but it can be very bad for you. And so that's why um, people will warn you, you know, don't use that stuff. But I think with chickens and certainly in comparing it to other means of pest control, it is definitely one of the more safer um, options that are out there. So I, I will, you know, you could use diatomaceous earth in the coop. 
Um, don't use it if you're if you're doing deep litter method. Okay, if you stop deep litter method, then you can use the diatomaceous earth. But um, and there's some differing opinions on this, but um, I don't use it when I'm doing the deep litter method because it does affect bacteria, and so um, that's that's why I would I would stop the deep litter method and then use the diatomaceous earth if you want to go that route. There's also another product, and I, I've never used this product. I, uh, they seem like great people. It's a, it's a relatively small company, and they're sold on – they sell their stuff on My Favorite Chicken. Um, it's called – what is it called? Uh, First Saturday Lime. First Saturday Lime. That's what it's called, right? Um, I think so. <laughs> and this is another product that you can sprinkle around your coop. You can put it in the nesting boxes. You can put it in there um, dusting – uh, you know, their little dust bath. Um, and yeah, and that will help also to repel insects. So, so those are things that will help. Um, I definitely limit these types of things, like especially diatomaceous earth. Like I, I don't know that much about first Saturday lime, so I can't talk extensively about it, but for diatomaceous earth, I do limit them to the coop because I do limit it to the coop because, um, it does affect other beneficial critters. And we don't want that. We don't want to create that imbalance. So uh, we don't want bees to get affected by it. Um, and I've seen videos where, you know, somebody was just dumping diatomaceous earth all over the chicken yard. And I, like, I get it. I understand, you know, and maybe there are extreme situations where you would need to do that. There was like some kind of infestation where you would have to do that. But I think you need to be um, really mindful about that because there's a very important ecosystem that's just in your soil. That's like the microbiome. And you want that to be healthy. You want that bacteria to be growing in there. You want it to be balanced in there. So you don't want to disturb that by putting something into your chicken yard that's going to create that imbalance because that can cause other problems. Okay? All right. Oh, Bert. Do you like it, Bert? He says he uses first Saturday lime. <laughs> Doo -doo -doo. Okay. And so uh, let me just confess something very embarrassing right now in this moment. <laughs> that is, I am such a sensitive person that I, I don't kill bugs. Okay. I, I can't kill flies. If I find a bug in the chicken yard, I will like save it. I will say to it, like, you better get out of here. Like you're going to get eaten. And I, will, I will like gather it up and like put it out of the chicken yard because I just, I just don't like to see anything get eaten in front of me. Okay. And like, I know that's kind of ridiculous, but, um, so I just, I, I really like all the preemptive stuff rather than having to do something that's going to kill the flies right in front of me. <laughs> and that's like, like I, I went to go visit my friend. She has like a mealworm farm and I went to visit her and she had all these live mealworms and she was feeding them to the chickens. And I was like, you know what? I can't, do, I, I could never do that. Like, I can't do that. I just feel too sorry for the worm. <laughs> she was like, you'll get over it. <laughs> so far I haven't. Um, but anyway, I know many of you do not suffer from this affliction. So um, if you need something stronger, what I do recommend is something called Fly Buster. And so, and this is on the My Favorite Chicken website too. Um, this is like, I don't like fly tape because it's just like gross and like they get stuck to it. And that just seems kind of like, ugh, that seems awful. Um, but Fly Buster, what it is, is like, it's this trap and it has like bait inside it and the bait is like totally safe it's all natural it's totally safe for all of uh you know all wildlife and the flies get in there because of the bait and they they um you know they check in and they can't check out <laughs> so they're in there and they die in there and then um it like collects all the flies and then you can feed the flies to your chickens and I thought, wow, that's like kind of awesome because it's like, you know, we spend money or many of us spend money on treats for our chickens 
And of course, the fly, you know, the fly buster costs money. But in the long run, you might end up saving, you know, depending on the size of your flock um, you and how many flies you have, you may end up saving money because you've got these like super healthy treats for your chickens that you're not having to buy. So, um, yeah, that is another thing to consider. And and it's just not like super gross like fly tape. But, you know, fly tape is an option, too. <laughs> if you can if you can stomach it, you can do it. So, uh, Jason, thank you so much for your question. Um, I hope these ideas were helpful to you. I really hope that the flies are, you know, cooperating with you and that you're able to bring some balance back into your chicken coop. And I do want to tell you congratulations on your new flock. That's very exciting. And, um, you know, I hope you find a routine that works really well for you to control the flies. Thank you so much. And now I am going to open up the chat for questions. And if you have a question, please type it in all caps so that I can see it. Because otherwise, I'm like, <laughs> I can't see it. And there's a lot of like, uh, <laughs> okay, I like rumble one, two, one and two A. Uh, asks, what do you think about a maggot maker bucket? So what they're talking about is like a system that where you, you can make maggots. And I don't know if you're talking about like a specific, if there's like a product that's called a maggot maker bucket, <laughs> but I had a friend that made one and it was just like the system where, uh, she grew maggots basically in this bucket. Um, and what I think about that is if you can stomach it, I think that's awesome because it's like really good food for your chickens. You know, I mean, it's sustainable, you know, healthy, uh, non-GMO organic, you know, if you're doing it yourself. Um, I think that would be, I think that would be a great idea if you can do it. Um, I have not done that, <laughs> but maybe I will someday. Susie. Susie says, to evict spiders, I grab them by one leg and show them the door. <laughs> Do they still have the leg? <laughs> yeah, they, they don't expect that. So Corn Fed Life asks, if we've never had chickens, how many should we start with? So I would say, you know, this is my advice. I really don't like to do less than four chickens. And the reason for that is, let's say, you know, some people are like, oh, I'm just going to get two chickens. And they get two chickens and one of them ends up being a rooster and they can't keep it. Or one of them, for whatever reason, it dies. And they have one chicken and then they have a problem because it's it's tough once you have an established flock, even if it's just a flock of one to integrate new chickens into that flock because of the pecking order. So I'm not saying it can't be done, but if it's your first flock, that can be a little bit of a challenge for you and bring some stress to you right when you're starting out, which is, you know, not great. So, you know, three chickens, that's better. Four chickens is definitely what I prefer to tell people, you know, start out with that. Now, if you have a big family or if you want to, um, give eggs to your neighbors, or if you want to sell eggs, then you're going to need to have more than that. Um, if you have like six people in your family and they all eat eggs, then you, I would get a chicken, start out with a chicken for each member of your family and just start there. It's always better in my opinion to kind of start small with the minimum of four than it is to start out really big. Like, you know, oh, start, you know, you start out with 20 chickens. Um, that works for some people. So, you know, I have a friend uh, that he was like, he messaged me, he messaged me and he was like, I'm getting, I'm getting eight chickens. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Then he messages me like uh, two days later, I'm getting 12 chickens. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then, I'm getting 16 chickens. And then I'm like, okay. 
<laughs> and then he's like, we got the chickens. We got 20. <laughs> and then I, I'll just tell you who it is. It was Tim Schmoyer from Video Creators. <laughs> so, and I was like, it was, it was so funny. It was like, it was like chicken math just happening right before my eyes. <laughs> but, but he was like, I mean, he got, he, the type of person he is, um, he's just really, really smart and re does a lot of research and stuff and doesn't go into anything, just kind of, he doesn't like jump into anything. He really does all his homework. And so he, he was really able to handle that. And so if you're that kind of person, you know, go ahead and go for it. But f really what I try to tell people is you want to start out smaller because you're going to want to grow. Okay. And you also remember that those chickens that you get, they're going to have some really good laying years in front of them, but their, their laying years aren't great for their whole life. And chickens can live to be, you know, I mean, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. So you got to keep that in mind. Like eventually you'll want to kind of add to your flock so you can keep that flow of eggs going. So, um, you know, minimum four, if you can do it, if you're, if your uh, city allows that, um, and more than that, you can do one chicken per family member and start there. <laughs> Jan says chicken math is a thing. It is. <laughs> so Brandon says my chicken's scratch my chicken scratches her face and it gets raw any suggestions so um is it is she drawing blood is she scratching so much that she's drawing blood if that's the case i would really kind of like check her over and make sure that there's not um like a a, a, a parasite situation going on um, look and see if there's a, any wound that's there that she might be getting aggravated by and actually making worse by continuously scratching it. Um, keep an eye out for like bullying in your flock, uh, and just make sure that their nutrition is where it needs to be and they have enough space and all that stuff. Okay. Um, and that's usually where I always start by telling people, okay, think about the basics. Like you're having this problem. Let's just think about all your practices. Let's think about nutrition. Let's think about whether or not your chickens have enough enrichment. Let's think about whether or not they have enough space. Let's, let's think about how clean your coop is. Okay. So start there and then, you know, make sure that you kind of inspect that chicken and see if there's something that you can figure out, you know, regarding what's going on with her. But, um, I would think possibly it possibly, a, a parasite situation. Um, and, Look and see if she's got something that is possibly stuck in her nair. So the the nair is the like a chicken's nostrils. Check and make sure she doesn't have anything stuck in there. And listen to her and, and see if maybe she might have some kind of respiratory thing going on. Because that can kind of make them scratch at their faces too. Um, so I start there. And good luck. I hope you figure out what whatever's going on with her. So please write your questions in all caps so I can see them. My dogs are like all outside the door. Sorry, I'm just, there's a lot of questions, so I'm trying to find them. <laughs> uh, so Douglas asks, I have four chickens and they are three months old. I want to add four. There goes that chicken math. <laughs> uh, I know I have to keep them separate until they are closer in size. Is that a good way? Yes. Okay. So I don't know how old the ones are that you're adding, but once chickens get to be big, you know, once they get to the, especially once they start laying that really that pecking order is, is it's there, it's established. And so, you know, it is going to be, a process to integrate new chickens with them. And if you, if you're getting new, especially if they're babies, you're going to want to wait until they're almost the same size as the existing flock. So with, um, with uh, standard size chickens, that's usually around 12 weeks. Now, depending on the personality of your flock, you might be able to get away with integrating them a little bit earlier. Um, my flock is 
pretty nice. Like I, I, I can integrate pretty easy because they're just used to seeing new faces every once in a while. Cause I, I rescue all these chickens and we, we bring in new chickens. Um, but, and, but it might be a situation where you have to wait a little bit later until they're even bigger or a little bit older. Um, if they're bantams, if they're really small bantam chickens and you're integrating them into standard size chickens, you want to wait until they're adults before you integrate them. At least, and definitely if they're not, if there's not any bantams in that flock, then you really want to wait until they're adults before you integrate them. And, and you know, your flock might be different. They might be more accepting, but just to be safe, that's, that's my general recommendation. Okay, guys, I'm going to do one more question. So Shauna asks, my girls and boy absolutely go nuts for scrambled eggs. How often should I feed them this? Um, you know, if I'm doing something like that, I, I think scrambled eggs are great for chickens. And I will do, I will do a few times a week or a couple times a week. Um, I wouldn't do it, do it every single day. Dep and it depends on what else you are feeding your chickens. So um, so what I'm saying is you, maybe you could do it every day, but it depends on what else you're feeding your chickens. So in, in Chickenlandia, we have something called the Chickenlandia Chicken Food Pyramid. And it is a, <laughs> it's a pyramid. It's like the food pyramid that, that, um, you know, they used to talk about in the eighties back in the stone age when I was a kid. <laughs> um, and basically, uh, it has, on the bottom is their chicken feed, and that's the biggest section. So you want the majority of their diet to be their chicken feed. Now, this kind of makes me a little bit sad because, you know, for millennia, chicken, there was no, people didn't buy chicken feed, okay? Like, <laughs> chickens have been domesticated for a very long time, and chicken feed is actually relatively new. But right now, we have chickens that we have bred to lay a lot of eggs. And so they're different from their ancestors. And because they lay so many eggs, they have very high nutritional needs. And they, they just really need um, a certain type of diet and certain type of nutrients and amount of nutrients. So to make sure that they're getting that, you know, the best case scenario would be for them to have the majority of their diet to be chicken feed. Then you go... Uh, to the second tier, which would be like vegetables, um, you know, sprouts, uh, low sugar fruits, you know, healthy kind of, you know, greens and, um, you know, plant, plant life that would be in the second tier. And then on the top tier, that's the, that's the smallest portion. And in that you have your healthy proteins, uh, mealworms, grubs, scratch and things like scrambled eggs. So just as long as that is balanced and that's, that's in a day, you know, that is balanced, then possibly you could give it, give them a little bit of scrambled eggs every day if you wanted to, but it needs to be balanced. And it, you need, if they're, if you're scrambling up two dozen eggs for them, you've got four chickens, <laughs> you know, they're, that's, that's the majority of their diet, then that's not good. Okay. Now, if you're doing a bunch of eggs and you want to give it to them a couple times a week, then that's okay. And I would add, you know, if you can, you can put some healthy herbs in there for them. I really love oregano and thyme for chickens. Um, or, or there's also like prepackaged herbs that you can give to chickens. Uh, Scratch and Peck has one called Cluck and Good Herbs. It's very healthy for them. Um, you can chop up some garlic and put that in there. And that would be super healthy for them. So um, like I always say, it's all about balance. Uh, look at your flock, look at how, the, you know, how their, uh, chicken food pyramid is balanced and go with that. Okay, guys, I know there's probably more questions, but I, I have to go for the day. I just, um, you know, uh, yeah, I gotta, I got, <laughs> can we start over? <laughs> That's why we have to go because the brain stops working after after 40 minutes. It's really a steep decline from there. <laughs> 
So um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me today. Thank you to the moderator. Uh, Kelsey Paulus was here today, also known as the Chickenlandia Presidential Advisor. Thank you to Talking to Crows for editing this episode and to Double M Ranch for their wonderful podcast art. If you enjoyed this podcast, remember to rate and review it. You can give me a thumbs up here on YouTube or you can, you know, rate and review it on a podcast app as if that's how you're listening to this. That really helps me. It really helps to get this podcast out there. So I really appreciate it. But the one thing that I want you to know more than any of that is that you are always welcome in Chickenlandia. Bye. I'm going to go get some water. <laughs> Bye.